I, and thank, thank you, Chancellor Manukin, for inviting me back to, seriously, one of my favorite places on earth and for the invitation to speak at this excellent event. It is really a true honor. And when I had the opportunity to come back to Madison, a place that I love and consider home, where I grew up from a, being a curious kid to an adult with a mission, it was really a no-brainer, especially when I realized this event was in spring and later realized it would be 80 degrees and sunny, and the official opening of the terrace. So I've spent a few hours of my life there, so it was a very easy decision indeed. But the chancellor asked me to talk about what makes me tick, so that was a little bit of harder to come up with, because to explain my drive and my motivation and what it takes to chase our nation's leaders down the Capitol hallways and question them about their actions, trying to find out what they're really deciding behind closed doors. Well, that would take a bit of a, you know, that, that would take a bit uh, to explain my path and how I got here. To sum it up, it's about taking risks and failing, learning from those failures and growing, and never accepting no or no comment as the final answer. Those are the principles that have taken me to some of the highest peaks of journalism, even though I still get mistaken from time to time for Sanjay Gupta. <laughs> now, a, a bit of what my day is like. It can be humbling, and it's easy to get dejected. You can have a published story that breaks a lot of new ground and only to see a competitor break a much bigger story that gets even more attention or see a cat video get more views than the story you've been working on for weeks. You can crawl back in your bed and question what happened, or you can use that to motivate you. I choose the latter. My motivation rests in the desire to find out the truth and get answers, whether it's about Supreme Court nominations, the battle for control of Congress, government shutdowns and fiscal crises, impeachments of presidents, or an attack on the Capitol. My job is to tell you what I have learned and give you information that you have not heard before, then you can decide its significance. So I wake up every morning trying to answer that question. How am I going to learn something new that can help shape your understanding of a person in power or an issue that will affect your life? So I usually begin the day chasing two or three storylines that that at least, and ones that I hope I can actually figure out some answers to. And on any given day, there are several competing stories that are unfolding at the exact same time, all at different parts of the Capitol. It could be how Senator Joe Manchin may cast a decisive vote on a key piece of legislation, or whether Manchin himself may decide to retire and alter the, alter the balance of power in the Senate in 2024. It could be learning about what congressional leaders are learning about leaked Pentagon secrets, detailing what the U.S. knows about Russian plans in Ukraine. Or it can be about exactly how Kevin McCarthy plans to avoid a debt default by raising the national borrowing limit without alienating his right flank and threatening his hold on the speakership. My goal is to advance the story by finding out new and critical details. So the Capitol is a big place, so I have to decide where to stake out lawmakers for the chance to intercept them in that moment they are walking from their hall in the hallways to meetings and to votes, all while working my sources behind the scenes about, to tell me about what actually is going on. But each day is filled with risks. I can stand outside the speaker's office for hours, only to find out he ducked outside a side door, leaving me with nothing. Or I can find the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee after a day-long stakeout, pepper him with questions, only to hear no comment, no comment, no comment. In the meantime, my competitors may have made a completely different choice and allowed them to break some news that I don't have. But rather than deflate me, that only strengthens my resolve. I look for different ways to find information that will advance the story. If the speaker ducks me, then I will find someone he has spoken with to tell me what he actually said behind closed doors. If the intelligence chairman won't talk, then I'll work other sources to learn the significance of the high stakes debate happening in the committee. And the, that hard work and persistence often pays off. There was a time where during Trump's first impeachment, when I was the first to get my hands on secret testimony accusing the then president of deliberately withholding aid to a key ally in order to press them to investigate his political rival. 
or when McCar Kevin McCarthy first told me on live TV that he had the votes to become speaker on the 15th ballot, or on January 6th while reporting from the Capitol, I could rely on sources I've developed over the past two decades to help me understand what was happening in real time in the hallways while I was locked in my booth in the Senate gallery and broadcasting live, all as the mob was ransack ransacking the building around me. Still, that work doesn't always endear you to the people in power. In fact, the persistent often does quite the opposite, with many locker lawmakers eager to avoid questions and scrutiny about the decisions they make and votes they cast that voters like you ought to know about. Indeed, there isn't a day that goes by where a senator does not hit the senator's own, go into the senator's only elevator and hit door closed repeatedly when they see me. <laughs> and sometimes insults are levied, like playful ones. When Harry Reid used to call me the biggest pest in Washington, I took that as a compliment. Bob, Cor Bob Corker quipped that he would rather talk to Saddam Hussein than talk to me, <laughs> though he often talked to me and made news. Others can be more personal. Martha McSally called me a liberal hack and then fundraised off of it. Nancy Pelosi, who wouldn't call on me in press conferences for months because she didn't like my pointed questions about some of her decisions. But that doesn't stop the pursuit of truth, something that requires persistence and a strong worth ethic, traits that I learned from my parents who grew up with very modest means in India and moved here in the 70s to a country they had never been to taking a risk for a better life here in the US. And it was something my maternal grandfather did as well. He grew up in a small village in rural India, had a career filled with setbacks and successes, and he emerged as the dominant writer, poet, and scholar of his time in our family's native tongue and of Kannada. His works are still st studied in India today. My parents' gamble led to the Chicago area where I was born and raised in a, in a middle-class suburb where very few Indians or immigrant families were, giving me really a truly American experience with deep ties to a culture on the other side of the world and assimilating to a new one that my parents now considered home. Now, as I was graduating high school, I applied to many colleges and had lots of choices, but one stood out above the rest, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I rolled the dice and thank God I did. As I was pursuing a business degree here and making lifelong friends and memories, I decided to try something I had never done before, report for a newspaper. So during my freshman year, I called up the Badger Herald, spoke to Dan Alter, who was a sports editor at the time. He told me to go to the Nat to cover a hockey practice. I filed a report, and it sucked. <laughs> but it was my first report. I learned from my mistakes, and I continued to improve as I became more involved, eventually becoming sports editor in my junior year at the Herald. And I even got my first scoop in 1999, when Ron Dane broke the NCAA rushing record, and the naked guy streaked 100 yards down Camp Randall wearing nothing but body paint on a very chilly day. And I was the first person to report his identity. He happened to be my good friend Tim who went to the game with me. <laughs> so by the time I graduated, I wanted to break, become a journalist in a field that is very difficult to break into. I left after four amazing years in Madison to try something totally foreign to me moved to Washington where my parents had relocated while I was in college. I had no job prospects, no experience covering Washington, little clue about what it took to be a political reporter, but I took the risk. I eventually got a job covering federal environmental policy for a trade publication. I wrote my first piece there in 2002, and that also sucked. But I continued to get better. I grew as a reporter, learned how to cover Washington, and provide readers with new information. As I did that, I applied for new jobs. I got rejected. I applied for more jobs. I got rejected. Editors would tell me I was gr too green for Washington. I needed to go to a small market before even considering a job in the nation's capital. But I didn't listen to them. I persisted. I Xeroxed copies of my articles. I scheduled meetings with very busy editors. And eventually, that paid off. I landed one reporting job that led to another, that led to another, and eventually today at CNN. It's a path that I had not initially considered when I started in Madison a quarter century ago, but it was my experience here in Madison that set me on the path that I would eventually take. So as I told graduates here when addressing them at their commencement two years ago, fortitude isn't always necessarily found in the throes of a fight, 
but in one's ability to withstand the wake of defeat. So thank you for having me, and on Wisconsin.